Okay, I got the worst job ever today because I have to introduce a man who does not need any introduction. And that's hard because I have to come up with something. But I won't, be sure. Um, first, I want to give you a, I, want to, I hope you will give him a warm welcome, Mr. James Gosling. Welcome, James. It's okay. Well, I, I do have some limitations on questions. Like, um, um, I, I've never worked at a company before Amazon where I was allowed to use Amazon. So, um, <laughs> if you've got like nerdy questions about how databases work inside Amazon, find an S SA. They they know a lot more about it. Um, the other is the, that that. Um, you know, reInvent and that is coming up pretty soon. And there's a whole lot of interesting stuff coming out, which I cannot say a single thing about. Um, and most of what I'm working on at, at any depth is stuff that I can't talk about. So <laughs> I can tell you all kinds of stuff about my previous job or and in generality is what I'm doing now. But um, otherwise, ask me anything. Well, my first question is actually, I think, a pretty common one, because Java is here for somewhat 25 years now, and you, you created it with some kind of vision. And if you see what Java is now, how is that compared to the vision you created Java with 25 years ago? Did it turn out what you, think it would, what you thought it would be, or did it ruin everything, or what are your thoughts about that? Oh, all of the above. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's it's really sort of funny that in the in the in the beginning, um, Java was designed around a set of pain points that various customers were feeling in what is now called IoT. Right? It was all about building software for devices. Um, that needed to be reliable and secure and needed to be independent of architectures and yada, 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 needed to be able to be upgraded smoothly and on the fly, needed to be um, smoothly integrated into the network where the network was extremely heterogeneous. Um, and that worked, except that um, all the money was in data centers. And, 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 and so lots of folks sort of went and got, ooh, this is actually useful in data centers too. Um, and then, then kind of forgot that it was actually useful on devices. Um, you know, there are actually quite a lot of folks who use it in devices today. Um, certainly if you've got an Android phone, it's there, but um, for more sort of high function robot kind of things like you know, everything from Coke machines to the robots I built in my previous job, um, they, they often have JVMs in them. So, questions? I will start at the back, sorry, Mamoud. Okay, to uh, stay kind of in the, in the team, uh, as you described, uh, Java was uh, originated because there was some pain points you wanted to solve. Uh, nowadays, I'm very interested in uh, Kotlin, trying to address some pain points from amongst others, Java. Uh, I'm curious to know what you think about uh, Kotlin as a, from your uh, perspective as a language designer. Um, it, it, it's fine. <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 rather like, I rather like Kotlin. I mean, they, they pushed really heavily on, on type inferencing, which I'm a big fan of. Um, the you know one of the one of the issues in the in the early days was that the a major goal in Java was to hoodwink C programmers into thinking that what they were what they were doing was something that they understood, um, and 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 there are a lot of things that that that, that sort of in the Java world that that um, um, are sort of that way in, 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 in ways that still annoy me. Um, I will never get over the, the syntax of C casts, for example. Um, but, you know, 
that was then, right? But you know, for me, Java isn't the language. Java is the VM. And and what I'm you know most proud of about the success of Java is not the language itself, but the fact that there are a bunch of really cool languages on top of the VM. And Kotlin is sure certainly one of them. Um, Closure is another one that I kind of like. Scala, I kind of like. Um, you know, it's it's whatever works best for you. So, yeah, it's all good. Um, so, uh, in one of your previous talks, uh, which was, which is on YouTube, you casually mentioned that in one of the earlier iterations of Java, you had operator overloading, but yep. you removed it. Uh, and so, I, I want to know why. And uh, another question, or uh, related question, is uh, I was reading the Oak specification in the weekend. And in the Oak specification, you had the unsigned keyword. Um, I should stand up, I think. You had the unsigned keyword. Uh, but you had a note next to it, this will probably never be implemented, but you still have it. Um, yeah. And there is a story. I'm not sure why you didn't implement it, so I want to know why. Uh, I love operator overloading. It's been implemented three or four times. Um, the, the problem with operator overloading back when it was first implemented was that a lot of people in the C++ community then felt deeply victimized by operator overloading because there were a lot of people who would use operator load overloading incredibly inappropriately, right? So one of the problems with operator overloading is that there's only like a dozen operators that you can overload. And, and so if you want to do something that doesn't semantically match one of those do dozen, over, dozen operators, right? So you're, you're used to thinking of, you know, less and less than and greater than greater than is shift operators. Okay, they're shift operators. And plus and minus mean add and subtract. They don't mean like list insert and list remove or output to file and input from file. And, 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 and so, um, and, and this probably is because of a, uh, there was a large project at Sun that, 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 that died horribly where people had gotten really, really out of control using operator overloading in wildly inappropriate ways. Um, and those people had knives and access to my office. Um, and, 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 you know, so I was convinced that, eh, well, until somebody came up with a better idea, um, you know, the, you know, ways to, and, and, and I, and I still, still have that issue with operator overloading. The, the, but the problem is that operator overloading is so freaking useful for things where it is appropriate that it sort of ought to be there. Um, Guy Steele in a sort of separate direction did, did an operator overloading implementation, not on the, J, well, it was on the JVM, but he basically allowed any operator class character from all of Unicode to be operator overloaded. And the problem with that was that nobody could figure out what circle with a squiggle over top of it meant, right? You know, it's, it, it ends up being deeply in, inscrutable. Um, and, and so it's like, okay, so it makes a lot of sense for people who do math, um, which sometimes includes me, and I really like the idea of having operator overloading. Um, but uh, it, 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 just food fight after food fight. Um, the other question was about unsigned. Um, getting rid of unsigned, that one was me. Um, because I, I sort of did an experiment, um, which is I, I wandered around the halls and I talked to engineers that I knew everywhere and I asked them sort of puzzle questions about unsigned arithmetic in C. And essentially everybody got it wrong, right? The, you know, the problem with unsigned is that 
Um, many of the operators can't possibly behave sensibly. Um, you know, particularly things like multiply and divide. Um, well, multiply is one is the the weirder one. You know, multiplying two unsigns only makes sense if one of them is like zero or one. In which case, and if they're not, if if both of them are larger than one, um, you 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 overflow really really quickly before it gets gets weird. And the the C rules around um, overflowing and what they all mean um, were always like deeply confusing to people. And, and at the same time, if you look at the operators that people use all the time, namely add, subtract, and, and or, and left shift and right unsigned shift, signed and unsigned are exactly the same, semantically. You know, if you look at, at, at what, they, what they compile, so the reason that, that, that left unsigned, or right unsigned shift exists is because that's like the only operator that actually has a deeply different meaning that's really useful in unsigned. Um, and the one place where I currently miss unsigned is in comparisons. Because everything else you can kind of you can kind of do. And and at the and, and at the time I was thinking, well we'd just have like a a library of static methods or something or Operator overloading or something, um, and and none of that ever happened, um, and 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 you know one of the reasons that it got kind of dicey is that there are parts in the C spec where you know it says undefined, and mostly having to do with arithmetic, um, and I wanted to be able to say what things did. And um, for many of the machines of 20, 20 years ago, the behavior of things, in, if you tried to do them in an unsigned world, was deeply weird. Um, particularly if you do, did like mul multiplication and there was overflows. Or if you did division where like the, yeah. Division was just kind of like psycho because often they didn't have an unsigned numerator. You know, you would have to take an unsigned, widen it, and then if you if you tried to have a wide unsigned, you know, like a 64-bit unsigned, there was no way to divide because in order to divide sensibly, you'd have to widen it again, and there was no sort of long, long. Um, so it just made life a lot simpler to not have unsigned, because then you'd have to be explaining all kinds of weirdness. Um, so you said Java was more intended for like IoT kind of stuff uh, yep. in those days. Yep. So why is byte signed, actually? Because that doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm not sure what um, why is byte signed? Um, <sighs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that one, as life has played out, has been painful. Um, because that's, that's, that's one of those data types where I find myself always going and FF. And FF. Um, it, it doesn't actually cost you anything in runtime because every compiler worth its salt turns, you know, A sub I N, 0 X F F into a load unsigned. Um, but at the time when I was like surveying all the architectures that we had to work for, load unsigned byte was relatively uncommon. And, and, and it was like, okay, so if people use unsigned byte a lot, so if you're just like copying a byte array it doesn't matter whether it's signed or unsigned. Every architecture I could find did signed just fine. Um, and then there was also this, this issue of like symmetry with short, int, and long. And so I, I just kind of went for symmetry. 
Um, yeah, you know, I, I you know, I, you know, that's one of the things that's that, that annoys me because I do lots of bit fiddling in with bytes all the time because, you know, packets. Just a, a curiosity question. Um, within the latest Java releases, you see sometimes these new language constructs to, to, like, uh, with the new type of languages that they have, they're so smooth, they're so fast in the way you can, you can develop. And Java has implemented a few of these things now as well. And um, um, do, do you have an idea or do you have a vision or um, stuff that you can talk about? What might even be coming in, like, what's on the table? Um, so, I'm just a kibitzer in this particular game. Um, you know, the, 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 the Java crew at, at Oracle are the ones that, that lead this. Um, I know most of them pretty well, so I end up having lunch with them a lot and um, giving them a hard time about it. Um, you know, one of the things that, that sort of affects a lot of those discussions in the Java world is this, um, you know, unwavering dedication to performance, right? So. Lambdas took a long time to get right because figuring out how to make them so that they weren't like hugely expensive and didn't have like massive heap churn and things got inlined correctly and all, you know, so the, the problem with Lambdas is not Lambdas the language syntax or anything like that. It's, it's all the energy underneath it. Um, and that took, you know, a massive amount of time. Um, one of the features that I've wanted forever is, is um, what's, what I think is mostly being called value types, namely to be able to have something that's like a C struct that doesn't necessarily get allocated, but it, it, it has the same performance as a primitive. Um, the, the problem is doing that in a way that is semantically uniform and low cost, right? So what a number of languages do is they say, well, we've got a uniform object hierarchy, but it's like, yes, you allocate absolutely everything on the heap, right? And, and if you're willing to burn that kind of time, you can, you can make the semantic smooth. What then happens in some languages is, is they go, oh, that makes integers really expensive. So we'll cache integers. Uh, there are a lot of integers. We can't possibly cache them all. So let's just cache like the first to the 16th of all the integers, right? Then you get this, this, this problem of how do you make the semantics of, equal, of, of identity comparison work? Right, and there are all these kind of nits in the way that, that you think of identity that, that cause the distinction between a memory allocated thing, a you know, heap allocated thing, and an ephemeral thing in the, it, it, that's just in registers. Um, and I spent a bunch of time trying to figure out how to do that, and I spent a lot of time just, just weaseling through all these corner cases. And, um, you know, a few years ago, Brian Getz said to me, you know, we're really going to make this work. We, everybody really wants this to work. He says, I, I think we know how to do it. And, and, um, and I said, well, you know, it's going to be kind of hard. And he says, he asked me, like, how hard did I think it would be? And I said, about a dozen PhD theses. Because um, that's, that's kind of my uniform measure of hardness for problems. And, and Brian said to me, uh, nah, it's only two or three. <laughs> and then about a year ago, he came to me and said, uh, you are optimistic. <laughs> um, you know, because 
some of these things are 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 really dicey. So the you know the reason that you know objects and primitives are separate is that it's all about performance. There are things you can do, um, you know, because there isn't a separate identity operator for primitives. And if you can break out identity from equality, it's sort of like in Lisp, you know, the difference between EQ and equals. Um, life gets a lot better. But with objects, it's often really, really important to be able to have those two as separate things. Um, but as you get down to smaller and cheaper objects, implement, you know, getting EQ to work. And there are a lot of things that sort of spin off from EQ that, 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 are, that are kind of similar. But um, yeah, you know, the, 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 the number of PhD theses yet to, be learned, yet to be earned in language design is huge. It's just huge, but that's okay. Other questions? What was your first thought when somebody, I guess from Netscape, came up with the language called JavaScript? <laughs> and uh, second related is, uh, what do you think that that um, kind of means? Does it mean that something gets really, if it's really get popular, it doesn't really matter about how the language itself looks like or how it functions? Or do you, do you think there are other things why it's so popular? Yeah, I mean, one of the depressing things for me in language design is that to a first approximation, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, if it's available in the right place at the right time, um, people will deal with arbitrary ugliness. Um, you know, the... <laughs> come on, there are still people who use, use Fortran and COBOL. Um, and people use MATLAB and think it's nice. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wrote a MATLAB compiler some years ago, and that was a brutal education. Um, but you know, JavaScript was sort of funny because you know when 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 um, they were doing JavaScript, the entire use case was. Validating, validating values in input forms. And that's kind of as far as they thought it out. <laughs> right? Um, and so, so that you could like attach a, a piece of JavaScript to a text field and put a red border around it or not. And that was it. Um, and you know, they, you know, so, so, so like, like in retrospect, one of the things that really bothers me is that um, if you look at the, the JavaScript runtimes that make JavaScript fast, they are insanely complex, um, mostly because they don't have, because the language doesn't have static typing, it's very hard to do detailed inferencing. I mean, a lot of what goes on in, in optimization is, is, is theorem proving on the properties of the program. And a lot of that comes from the type system. And, you know, they said that they didn't want to have types because people find that inconvenient. Well, okay, but they still required people to type VAR something or other. Well, they could have done it differently, so you didn't have to actually type VAR. But you know, if they had if they had allowed like a couple of other spellings for VAR, right? You know, even if okay, so you don't like things longer than three characters, but could you at least have allowed people to type INT? I mean, if you just did INT, that one, it would make tremendous performance improvements in every JavaScript program. Um, or DBL or FLT or, you know, other, you know, BLN or whatever, um, WTF, um, you know, that, you know, you know, you know, if you can, if you can give the, the compiler a little bit of a hint about what you're expecting your program to do, every little hint you give it, um, gives it better, gives it 
a better handle on, on how to make it fly. Um, and so, yeah, and, and it turned into this horrible political football with um, Netscape who managed to kill themselves and, you know, Microsoft and IBM and everybody. Um, it, it, it turned into this um, food fight that came, became kind of unwieldy. But other questions? <laughs> What is the thing in Java, JVM, whatever, uh, which you dislike the most? That I dislike the yeah, most? Right. <sighs> well, it's it's hard to dislike anything more than cast. Um, <laughs> but I've already named that one. Um, uh, switch statements. Uh, um, the fact that if statements and the question mark operator are different. Um, uh, uh, the whole long rant on instance of um, and the interactions between instance of and casting. Um, it's one of those places where I, I really love the way that Simula did it. Um, but, you know, Simula didn't win and, and C did, so kind of went, you know, with the C syntax, which is like, arr. Um, I read somewhere that the square root of two is your favorite irrational number. Can you explain it to me? Why? I have no idea where that legend got started. <laughs> I read I, it in, I, in multiple places, and I was like, why? Well, I don't know. Oh, okay, well, that's a quick question. Right, quick, quick I, 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 there, there, there was a time when I had this sort of quirky habit where um, there's, this, there's this book, it's called The Dictionary of Curious and Interesting Numbers. And when I was a teenager, I pretty much memorized the whole thing. It was a crazy book to memorize. Um, but I, most of it is faded out of my head, and I, and I, and I used to reread it, and then I loaned the book to somebody and, and haven't been able to reread it. So it sort of, sort of faded out of my memory. But what I used to do was um, when I would fill out, like, you know, when you go to a restaurant and you get a credit card receipt and you fill in a tip, I always made it so that the amount plus the tip was an interesting number. <laughs> But I've forgotten all interesting numbers, so I now just make sure that they round to a multiple of a dollar. And, <laughs> and the reason that I do that is you look at, you then take your, your, you know, when you get the statement from the credit card company and you see a, a, a restaurant thing that doesn't end, in, that isn't an interesting number, then it's probably fraud. <laughs> One thing about it. More questions. So I uh, learned Java first. It was the first language I ever uh, learned. And uh, on the job, I learned some uh, JavaScript. And now, over the years, Java is moving more towards a functional language. It's, it's, it, it's got more functional uh, operators and stuff. How do you feel about that, since it was originally more like an object-oriented language? Well, so object-oriented and functional are not in conflict. They actually fit together pretty well. You know, so, so you know, amongst the features that are considered functional are, are, are lambdas or your generics. Um, but also recursion. Um, I've personally always programmed in a functional style, um, even before lambdas. Um, and many people look at some of my code and they get kind of annoyed at me. So like, if, if I'm writing a, a routine that converts an integer to a series of characters, I don't like allocate an array and start stuffing bytes into it. Um, I, I do a recursion. And, and so you can write a, a recursive function to take an integer and print it out uh, recursively, and it doesn't do any storage allocation. Um, and in fact, one of the, the advantages of many functional approaches is that they don't do storage allocation. Um, and, and since I'm one of these wackos who counts instructions one at a time, 
in packets one at a time. I tend to do that as much as it may, I make people, it, it makes people hate me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really good, really good thing. The, the, the problem with functional programming is that, that if you try to be really, if you really try to push it and make things, everything absolutely functional, you end up with a style that can be kind of twisted, um, particularly if you don't allow there to be state, you know, it's sort of this sort of like pure functional thing. Um, and then that gets, that, that, that makes people's heads explode. Um, so I find the balance between them to be more a matter, matter of taste than anything else. But um, yeah, I'm a fan. Um, other questions? By creating Java, you created a whole new ecosystem, a software ecosystem. Um, in the beginning, um, it was platform independent, uh, vendor independent. Uh, I stake my whole career on it, and I think a lot of other people. Now, 25 years in the future, to the, to the current day, um, Java seems to get uh, in, its, in its strength, where it was once designed for, in an IoT kind of an arena. Um, but nowadays you see that uh, the custodian of Java, Oracle, um, seems to have a tendency to go where the money is, the money is, and uh, they still are having uh, big legal battles over uh, Java on Android. They seem to, to have a verdict now that there's a kind of a patent or a copyright on the, the APIs, not the language. Uh, what's bothering me is um, they recently, they, with Java 9, they dropped support for uh, small architectures, uh, the ARM processing line of, uh, of processors. And by the short release cycles and support cycles, um, I'm a bit, bit worried if Java still uh, has the bright future it, it, it had. Because it seemed to go everywhere my interest was. It, it, it went everywhere, and now it seems to be shrinking, uh, like where the big money is. Yeah, so, you know, for the longest time after the acquisition, they were behaving pretty well. And then they were sort of like getting a little more poorly behaved. Um, but the community was in this mode of appeasing. Um, and it's now become really difficult for the community to keep appeasing Oracle. Um, so I expect that to change. Um, and, you know, so I was, you know, pretty depressed about this a few months ago, and I'm not so depressed now just because it feels like the right things are happening. Um, lots of other folks are doing a really good job of support. Um, the open JDK world has gone from being sort of a PR side hobby of sons to being a real thing. Um, it's certainly what Amazon uses internally almost everywhere. Um, then you've got people like Red Hat who do, who do uh, support. There's a little company called Azul that does support. They, they do really nice support. Um, the support for small architectures that, that Oracle dropped. Um, Fortunately, other people have been picking that up. Um, in, my, in my previous job, we were using the, the embedded VM from Azul. And um, they, 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 they cover all kinds of extremely weird flavors. Um, and the, the, the Azul embedded VM for us was just brilliant. I just loved it. They did a really, really good job. Um, but you know, the 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 uh, ARM support in OpenJDK is pretty decent and getting better. Um, the you know, I expect that like the the LLVM code generator in, in 
integrations to get better. Um, and, and, you know, the thing about what Oracle is doing right now is that they're kind of forcing the community to engage. Uh, because for the longest time, the community just kind of let the, the Java organization drive. And um, not quite clear where that's going, because, um, but, but I'm, you know, just from talking to people all over, um, I'm getting pretty, pretty happy about it. Um, but who knows? What are your thoughts on the lawsuit between Oracle and Google concerning uh, uh, API copyright? Um, it's silly. <laughs> um, I mean, it, you know, there were bad actors on both sides. I mean, the, the Google guys were just crazy when they, when they, when they started the stuff that they did. Um, and then, with the, with the lawsuit that, that, that Oracle's been driving, they're just crazy. And I mean, one way to think of Oracle, it's, it's a big legal firm with some engineers on staff. <laughs> um, and, you know, they, they, they don't, the, the thing that's hard to understand about Oracle is that they don't care about morality or right and wrong. Um, they, they care about dollars at the end of the day and will they win or lose in whatever court case they're in, right? So their, their version of morality is, you know, anything that they can not lose at in court is good. Um, and, You know, so it's just stupid. I don't think that there's any big intellectual depth to the whole thing about API copyrights. I mean, that's, that's just, it's just nuts. I think that, 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 that if a really expansive view of copyrightability of APIs um, did really happen, um, we'd be screwed. Um, but the way that, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on the Oracle Google case, but it seems to have become so narrow and around such tiny nits that I'm really skeptical that it would have any generalized impact. Um, but who knows? It, it, you know, like I said, there's, there's nothing in here that's about morality or right and wrong or doing the right for the community. It's just two outfits with large legal teams going nuts. Uh, my question is actually with the evolution of Java and with new versions that we see that the, one of the edges that Java had over C++ was the garbage collection. And there was always a debate going on between the C++ and the Java developers that, okay, you know, I can control uh, the life of my object. I can tell it when it's going to uh, garbage collection. But now I see with newer versions of Java, which are still not released like the Java 10, we see that Java is itself going to come up with the garbage collector interface itself. So what are your thoughts about it? I mean, isn't it like more going towards the roots, back to the roots? Well, no, the, th the thing about having like a pro, you know, Java has al always had a, an, a, a, an interface to garbage collectors. It's just been really hard to get at it. Um, and, and the thing about garbage collectors is that they all have different characteristics. So the, the garbage collector that people most often use is one that's tuned towards throughput. So, you know, it's like how many objects can you allocate in free as fast as possible, exactly. yeah. right? And, 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 and in that world, you know, a, a, an object allocation costs you about four or five instructions and a deallocation typically costs zero. Um, so with the, with the throughput collectors, you get, you get amortized costs that are way cheaper than malloc and free 
but you get kind of bumpiness in, in latency, in that every now and then you'll get some, some level of, 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 of delay when it decides it has to do a collection. Um, and there are all kinds of games you can play about how you control that bumpiness, right? But there's, there's kind of a meta theorem somewhere back, back in, the, in the woods of computer science theory to the effect that the more you try to um, optimize for latency, you're, you're gonna have to pay a performance price, in a sort of a throughput price. And that happens in all kinds of things. So like, for example, um, if you've got a hash table, right, a hash table has O of one insertion cost, O of one lookup cost. Mm -hmm. The problem with inserting something into a hash table is that every now and then the hash table has to rehash. And that rehash can be kind of expensive. And there are a lot of algorithms that kind of look that way, namely they're really, really fast, except that every now and then they have to do some kind of work in order to restructure data somehow. Um, and, and there are situations like that all through different garbage collectors. Um, so different garbage collection algorithms have different characteristics in terms of how, you know, what their throughput is like, what the sort of statistical qualities of their latencies are. Um, you know, so, so things like the, like the G1 collector, it has much smaller latencies and they're spread out more. Um, but if you're trying to do, um, you know, so like, like in the, in the, in the real-time world, there, there are times when you cannot ever afford latencies, right? You can't afford surprises. So there's this whole category of, of garbage collectors that are called real-time garbage collectors where there are tightly bounded times. And, and at Sun, we implemented one of those like 15 years ago. Um, and the problem with, with a real-time garbage collector is it's gonna be a little bit slower. You know, and if you work really, really hard, you can get a real-time garbage collector to be, you know, about 10 or 15% slower than a throughput garbage collector. Um, but it's still, it's, they still usually end up being faster than malloc and free. Um, you know, so if you're, al if you're doing an application where you really can't tolerate pauses, um, but, but a lot of folks, they say, well, I can't tolerate pauses and I can't tolerate throughput problems. So maybe if the pauses aren't too big or too often, then I'm okay, right? So, so people get really squishy when they talk about the statistical properties of the timing of their application. Um, so it ends up being important to be able to have like lots of different garbage collectors. Um, mostly nobody should care um, but every now and then people do. Now we have a quite a number of off-heap solutions also in place, but exposing this interface in particular, but I believe it is in coming in Java 10, I, mm -hmm. I've heard it, I mean in the news, that exposing only this, would it be, I mean, really useful? Because currently we are already kind of in a, in a mature phase of development. Java's new versions are also coming up with newer features and everything. Yeah, so it's one more, right? And and the the, um, the the like I said, right? The interface has actually always been there. There have always been multiple garbage collectors. It's just cleaner. I have one question about the future of Java when you compare it to other languages of like Scala. How do you see the future of Java? Um, I mean, if you look at any of the programming language adoption numbers and usage, usage patterns. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm thrilled or appalled at how well Java does, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of debate going on about language features and JVM features and all of that. And um, I burned out on that topic a long time ago uh, fortunately, there are people like Brian Getz who I don't think will ever burn out on that topic. 
Um, and so mostly, um, you know, I, I kibitz, I poke people, I'm generally really happy with the direction that, that the language evolution is going, um, balancing the needs of like somewhere around 10 million software developers is really, really hard. Um, but for me, the, the, the real problems aren't programming languages anymore. Um, you know, they're, they're tools and APIs and methodologies and, you know, low-level low, low algorithms for stuff. And um, in my day-to-day -day work, I don't come up with things where the solution to make life better would be change the language. Um, that's that's kind of not where the pain points I feel are. Um, but, yeah. Uh, I always thought of Sun as an innovation company. And uh, you talked about a previous company that was Gluon, I think, or something, the robots. Uh, and then you joined uh, Amazon. We had this amazing talk from Rohan. And I never thought of Amazon as sort of a great innovator. I know they were a bookseller and they know, I know they sell Amazon. I, I was just wondering, why did you join Amazon? Why did I join Amazon? Um, well, so I, I, I kind of have a, a small number of rules about where I like to work. Um, actually, I really have two um, interesting things to do and interesting people to do them with. Um, when I, you know, when my previous employer, which in full honesty is the best job I've ever had in my life and nothing could be as good as my previous job because on, honestly, you know, a software engineering job where you have to spend a week, a month in Hawaii and <laughs> and you ha get to go snorkeling for a couple of hours every day to debug your software. <laughs> you know, it's like, phew, right? Doesn't get much better than that. But, you know, when you're doing navigation systems for autonomous marine robots, that's kind of where you go. But then, you know, when you get bought by a giant defense contractor, you go, well, maybe the fun is gone. So then I was looking around, right? and. I interviewed at a lot of different places. And, um, you know, one of the things that kept happening every time I would have a discussion or dinner, go out to dinner with, with, with people at Amazon, they'd always be interesting people. Um, and, you know, all of the projects that people were, were working on were interesting. And one of the things that's difficult from the outside um, is that, when you look at some of the some of the Amazon services like S3, right? S3 is conceptually a trivial service, right? It's you give it a tag and a big bag of bytes, and it stores it. Um, but behind that really trivial interface is a depth of complexity that's a Astonishing, because you know they they do it with like I think they're that are they're at like ten or twelve nines of durability, you know it's like ninety nine point nine 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 nine, you know the the the, the chances of the of the the sun spontaneously turning into a butterfly is larger than like losing is 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 larger than than losing a file on S three. Um, and, and that's like a lot of a lot of replication, and then there's all this stuff about managing storage hierarchies, so that thing, managing you know what things are hot, what things are cool, what things are cold, managing global distribution of these things. You know, if you've got something in a in a in a bucket that's being accessed by a billion people every second. Um, you get completely different behavior than if it's get. get gets accessed by one person every billion seconds. Um, and the, the number of, of services and really complex algorithms underneath S3 
is really cool. And, and S3 is conceptually one of the simplest services. Right? And then you add like all of the stuff that Amazon does around, around security. Um, it's easily the most paranoid company I've ever worked for <laughs> in, in, a, in, a, in a fairly delightful way. I mean, it does make life really awkward. You can't get away with a lot of things because, you know, the, you know, you have to go through an InfoSec review and the InfoSec review folks are pretty tight-assed. Um, but it's all fascinating stuff. You know, there are, there are people that, that, that spend their days guarding against games that people play with like the Amazon, the Amazon store. Um, there are people who spend their days figuring out how to get that package to you really, really fast and really, really cheap. How do you make that whole, I mean, the, the algorithms behind the logistics, it's not just like put it in a box and send it off. It's put a billion things into a billion boxes, send them to a billion different places. Um, don't screw up and do that every day. And, and, and it's like, wow. You know, if you look at these fulfillment centers, the robotics in their fulfillment centers is, 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 is just amazing. Um, and, and so there's just like cool projects ever, everywhere. Um, you know, one of the other sort of categories of companies that I, that I interviewed at were the people doing social media. Um, and I include like Google in there. And, you know, a lot of, of, the, of those companies, they have these inherent conflicts of interest. You know, that their, their fundamental business is selling eyeballs to advertisers. So if you're an eyeball, you have to understand that you are the product, right? You're, you, you, know, you, you know, you as a person are not a customer of Google. You are a, a, a product of Google and Facebook and Twitter and, and all the others. Um, and I interviewed at a lot of like the autonomous driving companies and um, having spent like the previous six years doing autonomous vehicles um, and you know the vehicles that I designed have up to now they've got about what are they up to now they're probably up to about four million nautical miles um, aggregate with zero collisions and or at least since since the collision software got installed, which <laughs> the, 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 the collision avoidance software is, is easily the most fun software I've ever, uh, I've ever built. Um, but, you know, when I talk to a lot of these autonomous car companies, they mostly really don't understand how hard the problem is that they're working on. Hi, James. I'm here. Uh, uh, actually, there will be two parts. One will be for the past, and one will be for now. Let's say 25 years ago that you created this uh, Java programming languages, pro 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 sorry, programming language. The question is, what or how did you feel like during those very first days? This is the first part. And the second part is, how does it feel right now by the time you wake up and you're, you are on your way to go to your work, during the work you are doing for Amazon, let's say, and also by the end of the day, how does it feel like having in mind that you're the person behind this programming language? Um, well, so there's a lot of stages there, right? So really early on, when it was first being built, um, you know, we started out by having this, you know, it started out as this, as this thing where, as Sun, a company that mostly did, like, computers, we had noticed that there was all of this stuff going on outside the computer industry that was kind of like computers. So a bunch of us went, or actually three of us, 
um, when it said, let's go study this and try to figure out what's going on, if there's anything interesting. And because we're like engineers and not like marketing people, um, the way we understand things is by building stuff. And so we started building prototypes and um, by then we were up to like six or seven people and part of the problems that we were having, because we were always building these prototypes when talking to um, people at these like consumer electronics companies, you know, the issues would come up. And so we were just like building stuff. And for me, it was just an intellectual problem because back then, my part of that, that, that project was go off and deal with the, the programming language issues. Um, because in the past I had done programming language stuff. In the immediately preceding years, I hadn't done programming language stuff for several years. So in, in the very first phase, it was just this intellectual curiosity that was kind of fun. Um, and, then, and then there's this sort of phase of you know, people going, you know, that's really cool, we should do something with it. And then trying to get people to pay attention. And that was excruciatingly painful um, and then people kind of went, oh yeah, that's cool. And it was kind of like somebody lit a rocket and I was just there going, what? <laughs> um, and that was, that was really quite astonishing. Um, and you know, as, 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 as kind of like an introverted geek kind of guy who's, who's much more comfortable sitting alone in a room with a keyboard. Um, that was really weird. Um, and and um, sort of coincidentally at about that time I had, I had really, really severe incapacitating carpal tunnel syndrome. So in the, in the first several years of Java's life, I was not allowed to type more than about an hour a day. I was like dictating emails. I couldn't even sign checks. I had a rubber stamp because I couldn't move my fingers and I was resisting getting surgery. Um, so I was forced into this role of being like a public speaker, which was initially like, I, I hated it. And then after a while, it's like, well, okay, this is, this is, this is not terrible. Um, but then, you know, as, as people started using it a lot, um, and then, you, you know, at about the time when Y2K happened, I don't know how many of you are old enough to have been involved in Y2K, um, but before Y2K, there was this mad rush to fix all these systems that were going to fall over uh, when Y2K hit. And a huge number of people decided they were just going to re-implement it in Java. And because amongst other things, I'm the guy that implemented the original date class. <laughs> um, you know, midnight of that day was really terrifying. <laughs> Um, and, and I did not sleep for days beforehand. And then when it was a yawn, I just slept for days afterwards. Um, and then, you know, sometime in the, in the few years after that, I just like completely burned out on, on all of that stuff and said, I, I gotta work on something else. Um, so I worked on a bunch of other things and, um, now I'm, you know, much more a Java user than a Java creator. Um, and I'm actually having fun using it. Um, and I'm kind of weirded out when I get stopped by people in the street to like do selfies and, and, and autographs. That's not supposed to happen to geeks. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, I just can't go to India anymore. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of okay in Europe because Europeans are pretty sedate and there aren't, but places like Seattle or San Francisco, 
can be a little awkward. My kids have gotten used to it, but um, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. Um, next question. As a language designer and um, uh, someone who cares a lot about uh, performance, um, you must be aware of, about the uh, Rust programming language, and they get like memory management safe and, and fast. Um, knowing that now, looking back, would you design Java in a different way? Um, like without a garbage collector, which is expensive still? Um. Well, I mean, Rust does gets a lot of its stuff by doing like like static allocation. That's 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 one of their 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 main things, and that works really really well for like low level and like embedded real time stuff. When you need to build complex hairy data structures, um, it. it you get into a mess where where sort of pre-designing things is pretty much impossible. Um, and you know, if you can't have data structures that 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 cross link and are dy dynamic, there are all kinds of things you can't you it gets very, very hard to do. Um, and and a number of, of the languages like like Rust and Go, they they want to want you to statically compile for a particular CPU. Um, and, and then people who do that, they end up realizing that, that, that they have to like compile their programs like 20, 30 times um, for like, you know, if you're trying to, I mean, we, we, we just got through a, 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 a major kerfuffle where um, there was some Go code that um, was just being compiled once and one architecture, but if you look at the microstructure of the data centers, it's like dozens of flavors of, of x86s, and they had to had to start running on ARMs, and then dozens of flavors of, well, many more flavors of ARM than x86. Um, so the, the, the whole static compiler thing, it runs into some issues that you may or may not care about. Um, you know, for me, the, the, you know, if you look at the, at the amortized cost of, of any half-decent garbage collector, it's much better than malloc and free. Um, and if you start doing complex structures, um, you know, like complex databases, um, if you're doing AI-like things where you're building you know, complex graphs that represent the situation. You know, in my previous thing, it was like, you know, building, you know, data structures from all the sensor inputs and trying to understand, you know, what's in the vicinity, what's going on, how the situation is changing, and then being able to, like, come up with candidate plans for the future, simulating it through the future, figure out what, which one leads to the best outcome. It's a kind of, I mean, the, in, in my previous case, the, the, the navigation program was much more like something that played chess because it's, it's exploring different ways of accomplishing the same end and then picking the one that was the best outcome because you can't just algorithmically say, turn left because that, that might have consequences with how, you know, so then you, then you end up with this, this complex branching structure of future possibilities if you're doing these, you know, so languages like Java with object-oriented programming and the garbage collector, as soon as you get to these, these complex, sophisticated data structures, um, it's, it's what makes the thing work. Right. If you try to, to, to do that, that kind of stuff in C and C++ with malloc, which I have had, which I have had to do in, in past lives, um, you get yourself into this, this hairball of trying to figure out which data structures to free. Because if you, you know, the, a, a common thing for people to do is, is the, the, the kind of segregate things into regions, right? So it's like, you know, this is, you know, time one, this is time two, and then you find you can't actually do object sharing. You know, if you look at most C code, 
because they don't know when their caller is going to release an object, they do a lot of unnecessary copying. So if you want to just you know, retain pointers and all of that, it sure is better if God is collecting the garbage for you. Um, so, you know, all of these, all of these different languages work really great for certain use cases. If you're not doing complex data structures and you want to be like down at device registers, then languages like C are beautiful. Um, and, you know, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Other questions? How do you think about checked exceptions? James? How do I feel about checked exceptions? Yeah. Um, I pretty much love them. You know, go back to the previous question about testing. Um, checked exceptions are what, 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 what tell you when you're about to screw up. Um, I mean, lots of people view checked exceptions as something that's really annoying. You know, it's like, why couldn't it just be like C where you know, F open returns null if it fails. Well, because nobody ever checks for null. You know, if, 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 if checking for errors is an explicit act, people are inherently lazy and they will not check. Right, and, 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 the, and, and the universe is filled with code that has F open of quote, you know, slash this, slash that, quote, and it works great on the developer's laptop. Right, and it's like, oh, what do you mean the, the, the path name is wrong for the deployment machines? Um, you mean that F open could fail? No. Um, and, and, and that kind of, that, you know, so it's, it, it's, it's my annoying way of forcing people to pay attention. <laughs> I'd like to ask for your permission. Uh, we talked a bit about testing the other minute, and uh, we also speak, spoke about uh, large, fat uh, frameworks. I'm thinking about uh, dependency injection frameworks. Am I still allowed nowadays to use this little tiny new operator? I, I use it all the time. It's fine. Um, but also, dependency injection frameworks are fine. I've written several. I, I mean, the ones in, in Java EE are really, really overblown. but. You know, you can, you know, and, and it depends on what you need, you know, and, and new is fine at the right time, and dependency injection frameworks are, are cool too. Exactly. Yeah, nowadays everybody seems to inject everything into everything. So at the other day I was uh, debugging a, a JE application, and I had this uh, session bean, and it has dependencies via CDI on a number of EGBs, and those EGBs had injected some little helper classes I didn't even know about. I didn't, certainly didn't care about them. But just to uh, test the session bean, I had to, well, set up an entire Christmas tree of objects I had to inject myself. Yeah, and I thought, yeah. Why did those and, folks and not use new over here? Because it's not really relevant. Yeah, and, and, and you know, in the injection frameworks that I that I like, um, one of the cheats is to be able to use new and stuff it into the injection object source so that you can then like depend on the thing that you just nude. But, um, you, know, it, 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 you know, it's kind of like the, the diet advice du jour, right? It's like saying you, you, you must always do dependency injection and that's the only way you can create objects. It's kind of like saying, all you're allowed to eat is kale. You can get shot now with as you as new. Yeah, nah, uh, you wouldn't get shot by me. Very quick question. Do you ever use Stack Overflow? <laughs> you mean the, the website? Yeah, I mean. Oh yeah, yeah, I use Stack Overflow all the time. I, al I always have, since I'm like, um, I started my master's a year ago, I always use it and I fell in love with Java through Stack Overflow when I saw that I could do my thesis uh, for my master's really much faster. And I'm like, yeah, just yeah. wanted to know. Well, I mean, it's, you know, the, th the thing I like about Stack Overflow is that, you know, anytime somebody mistakenly steps onto a trap door and, and falls down into some rabbit hole, um, they write it up in Stack Overflow.
you know, the, you know, the thing about most weird things that happen to people is that they've happened to somebody else before you. And, and it's really nice to not have to go through that learning process the hard way. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of stuff. It's not like I've memorized the entire API set of the ent everything on the internet. So I will come to the last question from the last person, and I had to give it to the one who ignited it all and made sure that, yeah, actually the idea grew to invite you over here. So, Mahmoud, you're, you're the last one. Oh, thank you. I almost feel moved. But, uh, almost, but almost. Not, not really. really no. <laughs> but thanks. Uh, uh, actually, a remark. Did you know that uh, Java is 23 years old? Uh, we obviously knew that. But did you know that Java is half the age of C and Smalltalk? Um, That's not my question, by the way. But it's just. Uh, <laughs> well, it depends on where you start the counter, right? So from my, from my point of view, Java is 27 years old. Since wow. the first program ran in '91. Wow, really? It took four years. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna. Oh yeah, the the, the 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 twisty paths in that four years was just awe-inspiring. Some great, some bloodbaths, and uh, it was it was weird. Do you got something to ask to the audience, James? <laughs> I guess the obvious question is, where's the nearest pub? But <laughs> since this is Amsterdam, they're on every street corner. Yeah, well, so I want to thank, thank you for your time. Thank you for taking the time, and thank you, thank you for taking the time for all these questions. Give him a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, James Gosling. And